the look of high frame rate, and I'll get to more of that slide in a moment. Perceptions of perception vary. These are two contemporaries, uh, Wordsworth, Donis Thorpe, and Thomas Edison. Donis Thorpe came up with the kinesigraph, an early motion picture system. He said the frame rate should be between six and eight frames per second. Uh, Edison, when he started with his kinetograph, said the frame rate should be 46 frames per second. Both of them said it was because that was how the eye worked. Uh, Electricity Magazine, talking about Edison, said now, considering that the retina can retain an impression for a seventh of a second, eight photographs per second are sufficient for the purpose of reproduction, and the remaining 38 of Edison are pure waste. This you may have heard of uh, recently since The Hobbit came out, quantum synchrony or perhaps quantum consciousness. Uh, there's a movie maker, James Kerwin. His most famous movie was probably Yesterday Was a Lie. And he's been talking about a theory of two scientists. They're not vision scientists, but they are scientists. Uh, an anesthesiologist, Stuart Hameroff, and cosmologist, Roger Penrose. And they had this theory of quantum consciousness. By the way, Stuart Hameroff will be at the Technology Summit on Cinema at uh, NAB in April. And according to Kerwin, studies seem to show that most humans see about 66 frames per second. I'm not sure what those studies are. Um, and then he quotes the others talking about a brainwave cycle of 40 hertz and a very strong theory that that is why we perceive 40 moments per second. And if a frame rate hits or exceeds 40 per second, it looks to us like reality. If it's below that, like 24 or even 30, there's a separation and we know immediately that what we're seeing is not real. Well, there's more than one temporal issue though when we're talking about frame rate. Um, here are some temporal issues, the fusion rate, the rate at which a sequence of pictures looks like motion, the flicker rate, Charles talked about that before, dynamic resolution, the things that are in gold I'm going to talk a little bit more about, and then sampling theory, we get into temporal filtering, the sampling aperture as Charles talked about, and frame repetition. Now at the right are two images that uh, were created by the BBC, they shot at 300 frames per second and derive both of these from it using uh, temporal filtering. That's 50 frames per second at the top and 100 frames per second at the bottom. If you look at the ties or the track, they are equally sharp in both. If you look at the train, it's not as sharp, but as Charles said, if your eye tracks the train, then you want to have that sharpness. So that's one example of dynamic resolution. Here's another. This was from the International Broadcasting Convention this past September. At the right side of the image is uh, an NHK 8K camera shooting at 120 uh, frames per second, super high vision. And what it's shooting is that thing on the left side of the picture that looks sort of like a television set. It isn't. It's just a roller um, that has pictures on it, sort of magazine quality pictures, and it's just going around very rapidly. Then at the right here is a display, and on one side of the display, you can see that roller at 60 frames per second, and at the other side of the display, you can see the roller at 120 frames per second. Very clearly, immediately to anyone who comes in, you can see a tremendous difference between the two sides on that display. So whether or not we perceive 40 moments per second, the dynamic resolution makes a tremendous difference. But and this is not something that most of the people there did. I came over and stood in front of this thing. And this looked a heck of a lot better than the 120 frames per second. So even 120 may not be enough, depending on what the object is doing initially, how fast it's moving, and so on. That's why BBC was saying for some source material, you may have to go to 300 frames per second. And we're not talking about shooting, although that too, but we're talking about watching at 300 frames per second. This was last year at HPA, the tested filter. Charles talked about that, so I um, won't do much there. but. Um, it's not really temporal filtering, it's intensity filtering in the time domain, but it does look good. It does make a uh, big difference. Um, now at NAB, 
last year at the Technology Summit for Cinema, uh, Phil Oatley, who's going to be here tomorrow from Park Road Post, which is where Peter Jackson does his stuff in New Zealand, uh, showed multiple frame rates and multiple shutter angles of tests that they did for The Hobbit. This was way before they uh, did any of the real stuff. My personal opinion from seeing this stuff is when he went from 270 degree shutter to 360 degree shutter, that made a big difference and made it look video-ish regardless of the frame rate. And it was a much greater difference than the frame rate. So going 270 to 360, big difference. Going 24 to 48, smaller difference. Um, by the way, the um, dynamic resolution issue is something that can happen both from frame rate and from shutter angles. So this was also at the Technology Summit for Cinema, and uh, Siegfried will be here this week also. Um, this is stuff shot at a frame rate, 24 frames per second in this case, at 72 degree shutter, and this is 216 degree shutter. And if you look at the boxing glove there and there, it's pretty much transparent there, and there you can see that it's a hand. So shutter angle or duration of shutter does make a tremendous difference. Charles went through this, so I won't do very much, but um, at the left is no image repetition. At the right is with image repetition. Where do you put the line? Uh, you could draw the exact same line at the right, but then you have those dots below it, or you could draw the line below it, and then you have the dots above it, so you get kind of a double image. This is something that was presented in uh, June 2011 at the SMPTE stereos Stereoscopy Conference. It's by Marty Banks, who has been here, uh, talking about temporal presentation protocols for stereoscopic 3D. And here he says that uh, flicker visibility is reduced when you present the images alternately to two lines and that um, the more flashes you do, if you do you know, effectively a three-blade shutter, you get better results than a two-blade shutter. But here he's talking about motion artifacts, and he says motion artifacts are worse with multi-flash than with single flash. So you have the opposite problem there. And then there's also problems of depth distortions, and those are worse when you have an alternating presentation than when you have a synchronous one. This was something new that I discovered at IBC this year. This was in a poster session, uh, lip sync. We are twice as sensitive to lip sync in stereoscopic 3D with alternate eye presentation as we are um, to 2D. Now, why should that be? Well, you know, again, it's this ambiguity that Charles was talking about, the blur in your uh, vision, if you will. If one eye sees something, should the sink be there? If the other eye sees it, should the sink be there? If both eyes see it, is it someplace in between? So what is reality when we talk about what we should be doing? Okay, this is the um, Lumiere's, the arrival of a train at the station of La Ciotat. Um, you can just watch this. Here comes a locomotive. The locomotive is not coming at the audience. It's heading in a different direction. There is no possibility, even if this were reality, that the locomotive would hit anybody. So not aimed at the audience. It's a silent movie. It's black and white. It's low resolution. It's got poor dynamic range, but it was a new experience. So a woman, when she saw this at one of the first screenings, jumps up and is scared that she's going to be run over by the train. Today we laugh at that, but in 1895 it was a new experience. Here's another new experience. The Edison tone tests. Uh, Edison, when he switched from cylinder to disc, wanted to tell everyone that his discs were so great you couldn't tell them from the real thing. So he would do these tests where people would be blindfolded or if it was a large hall, they would turn out the lights, a singer would start singing and then the singer would leave the stage and the phonograph would just keep going. And here's the reporter from the Pittsburgh Post. It did not seem difficult to determine in the dark when the singer sang and when she did not. The writer himself was pretty sure about it until the lights were turned on again and it was discovered that the singer was not on the stage at all and that the new Edison alone had been heard. You know, today we say, this is ridiculous. It's a 78 RPM record, and you couldn't tell that from the real person? But it was a new experience. Also, I should point out that one of the singers admitted in 1972 that she trained herself to sound like a phonograph recording. 
Uh, this is just to prepare you for a slide that's coming up. Visually induced queasiness in 1952. This was, this is Cinerama. And uh, there's the roller coaster and everyone screams at the beginning because they're going down the hill in the roller coaster. And do we want reality or do we want to do storytelling? And that's why we've had optical filters and digital filters for a long time. So this gets us to the crux, the Hobbit. The technology shot at 48 frames per second, seen at 48 frames per second, but also 24. So they had to be prepared for that was shown with image repetition. Uh, the stereoscopic screenings typically used an alternate view system. Some reviews talked about queasiness. Some reviews said it had a look that affected the ability to suspend disbelief. But was the queasiness caused by anything to do with the 48 frames per second, or was it caused by overhead spinning shots, the roller coaster, if you will? Uh, were there stereoscopic viewing issues? The look affecting suspension of disbelief, maybe. Some people said, boy, you know, those hobbits seemed super real. So maybe that helped to suspend disbelief. But we've had a long history of this. Sound, color, stereoscopic 3D, they've all been things that people said, if you do that, people will no longer buy the storytelling. And there are directors who say, black and white movies were the best. Maybe they're right, but color movies are still good. Or silent movies were the best. Maybe they're right, but sound movies are still good. So you've probably seen this. This came out um, in the early days of Twitter, not so early, but 2009. Uh, that's Future Man on the right, and somebody saying, so you're saying people will tweet what they're eating for breakfast and upload pictures of their breakfast to a Facebook? And other people will look at the breakfast to make comments? Sorry to burst your bubble, dudes, but you asked, yes, that's the future. No offense, future man, but is everyone in your time retarded? <laughs> so someday we're going to get to a time when somebody says, you mean to say there was a time when people watched movies at only 24 frames per second? 